I want to share something really exciting that I'm involved with. It's a brand new podcast called Allegedly, and I'm the host. This true crime anthology series brings you a new true crime story in each episode, and it includes an interview with the actual person involved in the true story who either lived it or is directly connected to the crime in some way. Interviews are mixed with scripted sequences, recreating, for example, the verbatim words written by a killer. The series brings you original music, and immersive soundscapes bring you into the story in a way that most audio stories can't. And on top of that, we have top Hollywood actors playing some of the roles. In Episode 2, we have William Riker himself, Jonathan Frakes from Star Trek, playing the main role. In our first episode, we have one of the finest actors of our generation, in my opinion, playing the killer, Michael Emerson. You might remember him as Linus on the TV show Lost. He was also in one of Robin and I's favorite shows, Person of Interest, and he's currently starring in the hit show on Paramount Plus, Evil. But in the first episode of Allegedly, you will hear Michael Emerson in a way that you have never heard him before. You can find this new podcast, Allegedly, on the Weird Darkness website, or go to allegedlytruecrime.com, or you can search for Allegedly by Voyage Media wherever you listen to podcasts. Here's a quick sample of just a few minutes of the very first episode of Allegedly, entitled So Many Fragile Things. My name is Amy Steidinger. Today, I'm a teacher, historian, and author, but in 1994, I was working as a genealogist when I came across this story. On May 13, 1900, my husband's great uncle, a man who had been a member of a devout Amish community, murdered his wife and children. I've been on a journey these last 25 years to find out what really happened. How could he do this and why? I was helping my husband's aunt put together a family book. The religious group the family belonged to is known for having very large pages. I had been working for hours, reading the records that consisted of pages and pages, showing fathers, mothers, and often 10 or 12 children, filling the pages from top to bottom. Next, I turned a page, when suddenly there was only blank space. Here, there was a father, a mother, and their three children. The young mother and her three children had all died on the same day, May 13th, 1900. My first reaction was, that poor man, to lose his entire family. I tried to imagine what could have happened. Surely even illness wouldn't take them that quickly. So I called the aunts who were helping me with the family book. They had been helping me, calling back and forth, talking to me about the information, excited about this project. But when they heard my question, they said, we don't talk about that, and they hung up on me. I was surprised by their response, but I'm not sure anything could have made me more curious. I wanted to know what happened, so I went to the archives and looked up newspaper articles. Here's the first one that I found. Mrs. Thomas Mosier, wife of a farmer living three miles north of Tremont, Illinois, and her four small children were found dead in their home Tuesday. All had apparently been dead since Sunday. Their throats were cut from ear to ear. Mrs. Mosier's body was found in the cellar, covered with old carpet. The children lay in their beds upstairs, apparently having been killed as they slept. Mosier has disappeared, but there is no known evidence pointing to him having committed the terrible crime. Nothing has been seen of the family since Sunday, and Tuesday, neighbors broke open the doors of the farmhouse. They spread the alarm, but no trace of the murderer has yet been found, although some of the neighbors are convinced that Mosier wiped out his family in a fit of insanity. That first article had a lot of errors. It named the father as Thomas instead of Samuel, four children instead of three. The children's ages were wrong. I realized that this small-town newspaper was about 70 miles from Tremont, Illinois, where the murders had taken place. News must have spread by word of mouth. Maybe something like the telephone game? 
Sam became Thomas, a huge problem, I would imagine, if you're Thomas Mosier. Three kids became four, and the details became more grisly. I needed to find more accurate information. It was understandable that his family wouldn't want to talk about it, but I wondered about hers. I found a nephew who had compiled tons of information, including original newspaper articles that were no longer even available in the archives. He was excited to talk with me about the case and see something put together about it. The actual story was very different from that first article. Samuel was a very troubled man. He had been excommunicated by the Anabaptist church that he attended. He was not allowed to eat with his family and friends. He was not allowed to work for members of the church. People would cross the street when they saw him coming. He was originally punished because he was bouncing his child on his knee in church, disrupting the service. They saw this as idolatry. They saw him as putting his child above the Lord. Later, it was more about his inability to repent and apologize. But this went on for five years. As Samuel's children got older, they began to ask questions about why people didn't talk to their dad and why he didn't go to church with them. Sam was extremely depressed. He sought help from doctors, but they were limited in the help that they could provide in 1900. Medication like laudanum that they may have prescribed might have worsened the problem. He became convinced that the situation was destroying his family and that they would be better off if their suffering was ended. He shot each of them. He intended to kill himself as well, but he could not face God after what he'd done. After the killings, Samuel went west to Utah, where he thought he might be able to repent among people that didn't know what had happened. But when he got off the train in Salt Lake City, the headline of the newspaper said that a murderer who was wanted in Illinois was thought to be in Utah. He tried to shoot himself while standing on a bridge, but slipped and fell into the river. When the police intervened, they discovered a suicide note that he'd left in his hotel room. I am 30 years of age and reside on a farm in Tazewell County, Illinois three miles from Tremont. This trouble is all due to the Amish community I formerly lived with, of which my wife was also a member. Eight years ago, I was married, my wife also belonging to the community. The Amish community is a religious order, having their own church. They do not believe in any worldly pleasures, such as music, going to shows, or anything of that kind. I grew away from their beliefs, but they kept control of my wife, and the church people came between us continually. One time in the church, I took my baby, eight months old or so, on my lap and was looking at him. The minister rebuked me, saying I was becoming an idolater and thought too much of my child. That is part of the religion, not to care too much for the family. I was not happy in the community and at last, two or three years ago, got my wife to leave and we went away. But they wrote her and got her to go back. I remained away a little while longer but could not bear to be separated from my children and so I returned. Then they interfered between us and peace was broken up in my home. I could not have my friends at my home anymore and the little boys commenced to notice it. The oldest asked why it was my wife would eat her meals with the boys and then I would go to the table. The boys asked why it was. It hurt them and hurt me. I tried everything, but matters did not mend. There was no chance for a change. My children noticed the trouble and this made me very unhappy. There was no chance of any improvement. And I became desperate. On Sunday, May 13, my wife went to church with the children, and I was left alone in the house. Between four and five o'clock in the afternoon, they returned, and my wife commenced making preparations for supper. The boys were out in the yard, and she went down cellar for something. 
I followed her down, and as she looked at me, I fired just one shot. If you want to hear this whole episode, you can subscribe to my brand new podcast, Allegedly. Visit AllegedlyTrueCrime.com or WeirdDarkness.com slash Allegedly to subscribe. You can also search for Allegedly by Voyage Media wherever you listen to podcasts. I can't tell you how excited I am about this brand new podcast series, Allegedly. I really think you'll love it.